I posted this YouTube short in 2022 showing new insulation inside the solid walls of an old building. The video has been viewed over 200,000 times, but if I designed this project today, I wouldn't do the insulation the same way. So did I make a mistake? Did I mess up this old building? Stay tuned to find out. The point of the original video was to show how much space is needed to insulate inside an old building so that it can become legally habitable. I didn't go into detail on the type of insulation, that wasn't the point. If you are planning to insulate inside the solid walls of an old building, this is the video for you. There are several things to understand about doing this type of work and I've put timestamps below. Let's get started. How thick should the insulation be inside a solid wall? This is one of the biggest problems with insulating inside an old building. The thicker the insulation, the more space it will take up. It's important to understand one thing. Are you renovating an existing dwelling, like a house or a flat, or are you converting a building that is not currently a house or a flat so that it will become a dwelling? The answer to this question will determine how much insulation you need to use. If it's just a renovation to an existing dwelling, the building regulations don't require any insulation. If you're doing this to increase the efficiency of your home, you can choose whatever thickness of insulation suits your space and budget. The information in this video still applies because, it turns out, what matters most is the method of construction and the type of insulation rather than its thickness. I will explain more later. The project in the video was a conversion. The original building had been a hotel, but the new owners wanted to convert it to a mixed use, with offices on the ground floor and flats above. The footage was taken in the flats, and that's why the insulation is so thick. We had to meet the full standard for thermal efficiency in order to convert this space to be legally habitable as a dwelling. Insulating internally like this will affect any original features in an old building, such as cornices, which is why I described it as a destructive method and made clear it's usually not suitable if the property is listed. What is best practice for insulating a solid wall? The building regulations application, known as a building warrant in Scotland, was made for this project back in 2020, but construction was massively delayed by COVID. This is important because best practice has changed over time, and I would not do it this way today. Many people in the comments asked about the cavity between the solid wall and the insulation. Why is it there? Is it ventilated? How did we fit a breather membrane? And so on. My original plan for the insulation was to stick it directly to the inside surface of the wall, but the building standards officer insisted on the cavity, because this diagram in the Scottish building regulations says that's the way it should be done. A minimum 25mm cavity between the inner surface of a solid wall and the insulation. There's no requirement for the cavity to be ventilated and, oddly enough, no mention of a vapour control layer or breather membrane. Since this was done, I have been researching the topic and I'm going to use diagrams from greenspec.co.uk to explain some concepts and show different ways of insulating solid walls. I'm also going to refer to this UK government document on best practice for retrofitting internal insulation. The document was published in 2021 and wasn't available when I designed the original project. It has 59 pages, so I will give you the TLDR on this. The first thing to understand is how solid walls get wet and how they dry out. The building in the video is in Scotland, and many people imagine that it rains continuously here. It's shite being Scottish! But that isn't the case. Just look at this 3D rainfall map of Scotland. The west coast gets a huge amount of rain compared with the east coast, where I am based. A rainfall chart of the UK shows the same thing. The amount of rain falling on your building will depend on where it is, and that makes a big difference in how wet the walls get. Local conditions also play a big role. The original building did have damp walls, but that was caused by defective gutters. Once they were fixed, the walls dried out. But in researching this topic, I learned something interesting. We can all understand the sun and the wind drying a wall from the outside, but it turns out solid walls also dry from the inside. This is how traditional solid stone and brick walls were built, with a lath and plaster internal lining. This traditional material is breathable, so if the wall became saturated it could dry out in both directions. Sunshine and wind on the outside and a warm house on the inside would draw the moisture out. This creates the potential for a big problem if your solid wall regularly gets saturated and you then fit modern, non-breathable PIR insulation on the inside. The water in the wall would usually evaporate inside the house, but is now trapped behind the new insulation and it will eventually lead to mould and rot taking hold. This is the worst case scenario and it won't happen in every building. 
I don't expect it to happen on my project because it's located in a place with low rainfall. The ground around the building is not prone to flooding, the roof has been repaired, the walls have been repointed, and the building is open on all sides, so each wall gets plenty of wind to help dry it out. At this stage, you might be thinking, Neil, how will I know if my building is at risk of damp walls, and what can I do about it? You can see from the greenspec.co.uk page, they show different ways of insulating solid walls. There is no one-size-fits-all method, but I think they have one method that is better than the rest, and works with even the dampest walls. The first few methods fix the new insulation onto the inner face of a solid wall, but they all rely on sealing that inner face using a parge coat, that is, plastering over the wall to make it airtight. Greenspec have a different approach if the wall is damp. They build a frame with a cavity off the wall, just like I did in the original video, but they use mineral fibre insulation instead of the dense plastic PIR that I specified. This is what is known as a vapour open insulation method. Water droplets can travel through the mineral fibre insulation, and if this is combined with a breathable vapour barrier and plasterboard that is taped rather than plastered, the whole wall can breathe. A vapour open insulation method allows a solid wall to continue drying out from the inside, just like the traditional construction methods used in old buildings. This will prevent moisture building up behind the new insulation, where you can't see the mould and rot until it's too late. This is the method I will most likely use from now on when insulating inside a solid wall, because it takes the guesswork out of assessing how damp that wall might be. The Guide to Best Practice describes this as the lowest risk approach to insulating internal walls, but there is one downside. This method takes up more space because breathable insulation is not as efficient as dense plastic PIR insulation. I did these two U-value calculations to show the difference. To achieve the same energy efficiency as a wall built with 140mm PIR, I would need to use almost 80mm more mineral wool. The overall buildup from the inner surface of the solid wall would be 256mm, that's 10 inches of space lost inside the room if you want to convert a building into a dwelling and meet today's energy efficiency standards while also allowing the wall to breathe. Of course, if you're converting a building into a dwelling, there is more to consider than just the wall. The roof, floor, windows and doors also need to be upgraded. And if you are upgrading windows or doors, check out the sponsor of today's video. Sunflex UK designs and manufactures high quality aluminium windows and doors in the UK. I've used them on several of my own projects and I believe they offer a great balance between cost and quality. Don't just take my word for it though, check out these videos I made, which include the costs. There's a link up here and in the description below. Why isn't vapour open insulation more common? I wasn't taught this stuff as a student, because back then the focus was almost exclusively on creating new buildings. But over the past 20 years, the housing crisis in the UK has encouraged more people to explore converting older properties into new homes. We are also getting serious about making existing homes more energy efficient. Solid walls, whether stone or brick, were common until about 100 years ago, when cavity walls began to be used more widely. This type of work is only going to become more widespread. The knowledge around how to do this is patchy, sometimes contradictory, and it has not yet been codified into our building regulations. Many of us in the industry are having to relearn old concepts when dealing with old buildings, but we are also having to learn entirely new concepts around air tightness. This is going to become even more complex as we move towards a passive house or inner fit approach to converting existing structures. I am on the path to learning more about this for my own practice because I can see the writing on the wall. As I learn more, I will make content about it, so subscribe to the channel to keep up to date. If you would like my advice about your project, no matter where it is in the UK, check out the reallifearchitecture.co.uk website. You can book a consultation with me and get specific advice about your property. There's a link in the description and please read the terms and conditions before you book. If you found this video useful, check out this playlist and be sure to drop a like, it really helps the channel.